Привет. Мы будем потихонечку начинать. Ну, просто на самом деле зал еще наполовину пуст, так что вам придется послушать, как я говорю вначале. Меня зовут Сергей, я организатор C++ Russia. Спасибо вам большое, что вы приехали. Это очень круто и очень здорово. У нас в этом году самая большая конференция. Из всех, что мы проводили, нас здесь соберется почти 800 человек. Точнее, уже собралось. Кажется, что это очень здорово и что мы скоро взорвемся, наверное. Но перестанем помещаться в любые площадки Санкт-Петербурге и Москве. Это круто. Как всегда, я очень хочу вас всех поблагодарить за то, что вы делаете эту конференцию. Потому что как только вы перестанете приезжать, конференции, соответственно, не будет. Наверное, это будет что-то маленькое. Конференцию формально, ну, вообще, организует конференцию сообщества C++ программистов России. Мы проводим разные этапы и конференции по C++ по всей нашей необъятной родине. Может быть, вы слышали, что у нас есть C++ Сибирь. И куча метапов в разных городах. Делаем мы это просто потому, что это очень круто. Ну, собственно, как и C++ конференцию. В Russia, C++ Russia мы делаем, потому что это очень-очень здорово. Вот. И стали мы это делать, потому что никто не делал, а очень хотелось сходить на такую конференцию. Так что мы делаем такую конференцию, какую, на какую сами хотим сходить. При этом, если вам что-то не нравится, пожалуйста, пишите нам. У нас есть <coughs> бот в Телеграме и чат в Телеграме для фидбэка. Пишите нам на почту, мы очень рады всей вашей ненависти. Вот, и будем рады почитать, что можно исправить и сделать лучше. Ну, я надеюсь, нам простите какие-то мелкие огрехи, которые у нас иногда бывают. Все-таки сегодня в этот раз у нас 800 человек. И сконцентрируйтесь на программе, потому что мы старались сделать так, чтобы вам было в первую очередь интересно здесь быть. У нас э, очень много людей приехали с документооборотом. Ребят, давайте мы встретимся все сегодня. Я буду э, сидеть на стойке регистрации и слушать, что вам нужно от меня и записывать. Я сегодня запишу, мы с вами все проговорим, а завтра в это же время там же встретимся, я дам вам все, что нужно. Хорошо? Там опять же не все собрались, передайте, пожалуйста, всем. Я очень бы хотел поблагодарить всех наших спонсоров за то, что они нам очень сильно помогают и делают наш досуг интереснее. И думаю, что Джон, ready? Uh, let's welcome John Kalb. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to say I've been made to feel very welcome and um, I'm very happy to be in the homeland of Alex Stepanov, my idol. Alex and I worked together at the same company for a while. We worked at A9 and there were a number of Russian speaking uh, engineers there and so I, I keep in contact with some of them and I was talking to one, uh, a friend of mine, his name is Sergei, and I said, Uh, I've been invited to the old capital of Russia to give a talk. And he looked at me and he said, and I want to make sure I got this right, he said, Yazik da Kieva do vidiet. And I said, I'm going to be speaking in C++. And he looked at me and he shook his head and he said, Do Sugundura. So I only know 10 words in Russian, and one of them is Sugundura. We're going to be talking about uh, C++ today, the beast is back. And this is actually the name of a book that I wrote with Gaspar Asman. And it was published by O'Reilly Media. O'Reilly paid us to write this book, not very much. But they paid us to write this book, but it turns out if they're giving it away free. Now, when I say a book, it's only about 60 pages, so it's really more like a booklet. But is O'Reilly Media crazy? They, 
they're paying money to create a book that they're giving away free. Why would they do that? Well, it turns out this is part of their business plan. They, they call these reports. And when they see a hot new technology, they, they commission a report on it in order to give it away. So they want to uh, gauge what the, what the interest is in this new technology and, and get some email addresses so they can start marketing for the books and videos that they are going to charge money for. But the interesting thing is that I just said a hot new technology. <laughs> Is that C++? Is C++ a hot new technology? Well, it turns out the answer to that is yes. It's very old. It started in the 70s. But it's a hot new technology because the beast is back. And so the, 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 the story of the book is the story of the talk that I want to give today. To do this, well, I'm going to go back in time. In fact, I'm going to go way back in time. Who can tell me what that is? Who recognizes that? This is the difference engine, right. And we know who's peeking out behind there. Someone said it. Charles Babbage, that's right, that's right. Now the reason I'm including this is because very early computers, they of course hold data, that's what computers do, they manipulate data, but the software, we would think of as software, to manipulate this, the algorithms, the instructions to manipulate the data was actually part of the computer itself. Computers were purpose designed for a particular program. But this man, does anyone recognize who that is? That's right, John Van Neumann. He made the observation, he said, instructions to manipulate data are themselves data, right? Code is just data. And so a computer should be able to hold the instructions that it's going to use to manipulate the data that it holds. And any computer that works like that, and all modern computers do, of course, we call a von Neumann machine. Even if, uh, even if it's read-only memory, the instructions for almost every machine that we see in a modern machine today are part of the data of that machine. So who can identify that? What is that? It's assembly language, right? But assembly language is kind of a misnomer because it makes it sound like there's one assembly language. Of course, there's not. Because what is this? This is 6502 assembler, and the, the machine instructions are actually just numeric values. But humans don't process numeric values well, so we have, uh, we have mnemonics to help us remember what the instructions are. But every platform, every hardware family is going to have its own assembly language. So to say an assembly language or the assembly language is, is kind of a misnomer. There's, there's, there's a, an assembly language for every every kind of machine. And of course, this is the language that system software is going to be written in. Why? Because we want system software to be very fast. System software is usually at the bottom of the stack. And so if it's slow, everything's going to be slow. So if we want our machines to be performant, then the system software has to be written as efficiently as possible. And the other thing, of course, is that because we are able to access every instruction in the machine, we can do anything the machine wants to do. We have complete access to the machine as long as we're writing in, in assembly language. So, of course, uh, computing professionals will, are going to write in assembly language. But what if you're not a computing professional? What if you're a scientist? Then what do you do? Well, the scientist doesn't care about accessing everything in the machine. The scientist simply wants to harness the power of the computing to solve the problem they're actually working on. They don't care about computers. That's not important to the scientist. What's important to the scientist is the subject matter they're working on. The computer is just a tool. So they don't want to be bound to a specific machine, and they don't care about squeezing every last little bit of performance out of that machine, and they don't necessarily need to access every possible instruction in the machine. So for this, we have a gift. And John Backus made Fortran. Of course, Fortran actually stands for formula translation. If you're a scientist and you can express the calculations you want in a formula, then you can encode this in Fortran. And by encoding it in Fortran, you're not trapped to any one machine architecture because Fortran is a portable language. But what if you're not a scientist? What if you're a business person? Then what? Well, it turns out that business people and scientists are, are the same in this regard. Business people also don't want to be trapped into a particular machine. They would like to be able to write their 
uh, processing in a way that's abstract, that's not tied to a machine. And they also don't need to squeeze the last little bit of performance out of the machine. And they also don't need to access everything that the machine might do. And so Grace Hopper has a gift for them, a common business-oriented language called COBOL. So that's the, the world of languages, but what about hardware? Who can identify this? What is this? This is the, well, I should say, this is the user console for the UNIVAC. <laughs> the rest of the UNIVAC is not even in the picture. This was released in, in about 1951, and it was for government and business. This is for business applications. This is for people who want to do COBOL. And on this business machine, one of the things it has, one of the features that it has is binary coded decimal. And of course, we don't have much respect for binary coded decimal because it, it throws away so much potential storage space, right? But if you want to think like a business person, if you want to do those kinds of calculations, it's handy to think about numbers decimally rather than in hexadecimal. And it also had text processing powers because that's the kind of thing that uh, governments and businesses need. This machine, on the other hand, this is the uh, Link 8. This was sold into laboratories. This didn't have binary coded decimal, and it's not strong in text processing. What it has is floating point operations. This is what scientists are interested in, floating point operations. So this is the state of the art as we enter the 1960s. We have a division in computing. We have business and we have science. And those are separate. They're separate in terms of the hardware we're looking at. We're separate in terms of the languages that we're looking at. But in the 1960s, something interesting happened, and that is IBM, which had already established itself as the leading computer hardware manufacturer, released something that locked in that lead. It's called the IBM System 360. And those of you that can see up front, you see this red dot? Do you know what that is? Who can tell me what that is? That's, yes, the emergency stop button. Because science fiction writers were writing stories about the Forbin Project and all these things where computers go crazy and, you know, we have to be able to stop it. Unplugging it isn't dramatic enough. We have to stop it. <laughs> of course, we don't worry about those things now. We worry about AI. <laughs> How do we stop the AI? But, the interesting thing here that I want to call out is the, the number, 360. I used to work at Boeing. And as a Boeing employee, I know what the 707 stands for in the Boeing 707. That was the first of Boeing's jumbo jets, created a, a new standard for how we do transportation. And the number 707, who knows what that stands for? Who knows what the 707 means? Nobody? Nobody here works for Boeing, apparently. I, as an, a Boeing employee, I can tell you. It's not a secret. I can tell you. It stands for absolutely nothing. <laughs> Some marketing person said, 707 sounds cool. It's international traveler. Maybe it's James Bondish, right? 007, something like that is exciting. So when I saw, oh, it's the IBM System 360, my thought was, well, three doesn't stand for anything. It's just some number that somebody thought it's cool. That's not true. I later learned the 360 does stand for something. Who can tell me what the 360 stands for? The circle. That's right. The 360. It means everything. It means complete. And why was that? Because the marketing message for the IBM 360 was, now one new computer fills all your data processing needs. And by all, what do we mean? We mean business and science, right? It's like country and Western. That's everything. But what does that mean? What does it mean from a practical point of view? It wasn't just marketing. They actually backed it up. But what did they do? Well, what they did was they said, well, let's take all of the instructions that you expect in a business machine and all the instructions you expect in a science machine. Let's put them together. So this machine had... Uh, binary coded decimal. It also had floating point calculations. It had this rich, rich instruction set. And the instruction set, in fact, was so rich that this was actually the first machine to do microcoding. Previously, all computers 
You just hard code in the hardware the instruction set. But the 360 was, had such an elaborate instruction set that they actually made a, essentially a hardware language and the instructions were coded in the hardware language. The IBM did something else. The 360 did something else. Now, th this wasn't the first to do this. I don't mean they pioneered this. But they made an important decision, and because of the success of the IBM 360, it affects us even today. And that was they used 8-bit byte addressing. And we just take that for granted now. What do computers have in them? They have memory. What is memory? It's a bunch of bytes. What are bytes? They're 8 bits. It's just how it is, right? Well, it works pretty well for us. But we had to get to there, and in getting to there, we did other things. We experimented. No one just immediately knew that that was the right way to organize memory. In fact, uh, there were early machines that had 36, 36-bit words. 36 bits would allow you to put five seven-bit characters, and seven bits was enough for ASCII. And you have a bit left over, a carry bit. <laughs> uh, why would they do this? Why would somebody make a 36-bit word? The address addresses 36 bits. Why would you do that? Well, they're trying to save address lines, of course. If you, if you only have a unique address for every 36 bits, you don't need very many addresses, so you don't need very many address lines. Hardware was expensive. Programmer time, who cares? But hardware, that's expensive. So there were a number of computer architectures that evolved over time. But with the 360, IBM said, we want to be able to do text processing. And that's going to be best done if we can address individual characters. So what happened is that essentially the, the System 360 established the C machine architecture a decade before there even was C. But this model that all memory is 8-bit bytes and each 8-bit byte has its own address. That became a very important standard and we see that in almost all computers today. That's what we just expect. So now we're in the 1970s, and now we're ready to start looking at C and the history of C. Who can tell me what this is? What is this? Bell Labs. That's right. This is a photo of Bell Labs in New Jersey. And Bell Labs had three things that were necessary for the creation of Unix. One was they had a bunch of really smart employees like Ken Thompson, and the other is they had a need. Bell Labs, of course, is a research laboratory. They did a lot of research in communications, electronics, computing, and they patented those inventions. And so the, the patent office at Bell Labs did a lot of work filing things with the US Patent Office. And these filings needed to look professional. And so when a patent was created, they would have it typeset. And paying someone to typeset these large documents was expensive. And so Ken Thompson, who had been experimenting with a uh, operating system, in fact, he'd worked on Multics, but now he's working on his own operating system. And he said, you know, there's this PDP-7 that's just sitting there. If you'd let me have the PDP-7, I will write a typesetting system. He didn't say he was going to write an operating system, because who needs an operating system? But a typesetting system, well, that's... That's important, and that's what, that's what AT&T could use. That's what Bell Labs could use. So for those of you who've ever used NROF or TROF, the Unix utilities, those were the reason that Unix was created, was to create those utilities. That's, that's what Unix was for. Unix, of course, has been very, very successful. And so the question I have for you now is, what language was Unix written in? C. Everybody knows that. That's wrong. I just told you, Unix is system software. What is system software written in? Assembly language, of course, because it's, because it's system software, and system software programmers write in assembly language because that's what they need, because they need the performance and they need the portability, or excuse me, not the portability, they need access to the machine. But the problem was, when we get to about Unix system four, there's more and more interest in having Unix on other platforms. So it needs to be portable. So the choice with the Unix implementers was, well, we could re-implement Unix in an assembly language for another platform, but then we'd have to do it again for the next platform and the next platform. 
So he said, maybe there's another way. And so Dennis Ritchie, one of the people there at Bell Labs, started working on the C programming language, which was actually kind of based on the B programming language, which was kind of based on a programming language called BCPL. But the idea here was to make this a, essentially a portable assembly language. And this is a new concept because people thought, well, first of all, it's a contradiction in terms, right? I mean, the whole point of an assembly language is it's the individual instructions for a particular machine. And so making that portable, that doesn't even make sense. But that's what Dennis Ritchie managed to do. He created a portable assembly language. And in doing so, made a language that's very, very popular because it turns out that systems programmers are just like scientists and business people in that they don't want to deal with the arcane details of a particular machine architecture. They do need performance, and so C was specifically designed so that all of its constructs are readily implementable on virtually any kind of hardware. And they do need access to the machine, and C was written so that if you need to specify how you want to access the machine, you can. If you don't, then you can be portable, but you have that option as the programmer. So that became very, very successful for systems programming. But, and I'm inserting my opinion here, C has this limitation. When you get to a project of some size, let's say 50,000 lines of code, it turns out that C, because it's designed to be an assembly language, it's designed to be low level, it's designed to be highly efficient, and access to the machine, but it's not really designed for large projects. And it doesn't have high-level abstractions. And so as you get to larger and larger projects in C, you begin to have a situation where it's, it's harder and harder to manage the, the cognitive load of the size of the project you're working on because of the detail level of C. And so that's where we start to have we get into the 1980s so that we can talk about, of course, what we're here to talk about today, which is C++. But before we get there, I'm actually going to take kind of a step back, and I'm going to mention these two people. Does anybody recognize, I guess their names are on the screen, if you can read it. That's Dahl and Nygaard. Do you know who they were? Dahl and Nygaard? They got a Turing Award for the emergence of object-oriented programming and their work with Simula 1 and Simula 67. These are people who essentially came up with the concept of object-oriented programming. And the reason they fit into our story is because this man here, Kirsten Nygaard, he was a professor at a university town in Denmark. And it just so happens that that particular university town in Denmark was the hometown of uh, an important figure in our talk today, of course, Bjarne Stristrup. So Bjarne goes to school in his local university, and he's studying math, but he studies under Kirsten Nygaard, and Kirsten Nygaard teaches him two very important things, object-oriented programming and simula. So Bjarne graduates, and he's a very good student, so he got accepted at Churchill College in Cambridge. And he's working on his PhD, and part of his PhD, he needed to do a simulation to get data for the PhD, for his thesis. And so he writes his simulation. And what does he write it in? Simula. That's what he's been trained to do. You want to write a simulation, you use object-oriented programming, you write it in Simula. That's what you do. But then something happened. He ran it on the local computer when he got it ready. And it was such a resource hog that the administrators pulled the plug on the application. He didn't get his data. And what happened next is so important in the history of C++ that I'm going to break an important rule of presentations. I'm going to read to you from a slide. In fact, two slides, and I'm just going to read them. But the reason I'm doing this is because it's so important to our story that I want to drive home that point. So this is Bjarne talking. And what he said is, so I rewrote my simulator for Simula into BCPL, and all of the high-level structure disappeared. All of the nice organization that had helped me debug and helped me design disappeared. But the resulting BCPL, once I debugged it and lost half my hair in the process, ran really fast. It could use all of the resources of the machine. It could communicate with anything on the machine. And I got my data, and I got my PhD. 
I came away with the opinion that I would never again want to attack a problem with tools that were fundamentally unsuitable. And in particular, I don't want to make the choice between elegant, which Simula was for this problem, and efficient, which BCPL was. I want both. And that has been sort of one of my guiding lights. If you give people the choice of writing good code or fast code, there's something wrong. Good code should be fast. And that's really the story of us in C++. We want support for high-level abstractions. We want to be able to express high-level ideas. We want to be able to tackle very, very large applications. And we want to express our ideas with, with great concision, great conciseness. And we want to be able to express what we're trying to say with precision and with elegance. But we don't want to pay the price that comes with those not being performant features. That's the situation. So Bjarne gets his degree, and he goes to work at Bell Labs. And of course, at Bell Labs, everyone uses C. So Bjarne starts working in C, but he wants to be able to do the kinds of things that he did working in Simula. He wants to be able to do object-oriented programming. He wants to be able to write simulations. But he doesn't want to do those in Simula. He learned that. PhDs sometimes teach you something. And that's what he learned. We don't want to do this in Simula. What we want to do is we want something efficient, but we want support for high-level abstractions. And he felt like we could have both. And so he worked on a project called C with Classes. He wanted to add object-oriented support to the basic C language. Of course, eventually that name was changed. It became known as C++. And this question has been asked of Bjarni before which is, do you regret basing C++ on C? Of course, Bjarni would say, no regrets. Don't look back. Look forward. But he also said something else, and I think this is an important thing, and it says something about the way C++ programmers think about problems. The reason this question is asked in the first place is because C has some language baggage with it. It's very successful, does what it does very well, but the declaration syntax for C is not as lovely as one might expect. It leads to things like uh, the East Const controversy. Right. Um, and so that's why people would ask him. He said, you know, maybe basing it on C wasn't the right idea. Do you ever regret that? And what Bjarne said in response, as I said, I think it, 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 it speaks to the way C++ programmers think about problems. Because what he said is, if I hadn't based it on C, I would have based it on something else. And I would have inherited that baggage. Now think about this. He could have written a language from scratch. Lots of people do. In the history of computing, there are literally thousands of languages that have been created for one purpose or another. And most of them never had more than a handful of users. And most of them die off into, into obscurity. The fact that a language could have the success of C means it had some right chemistry, some right trade-offs. You can have a language that has one really, really good feature, but if it has significant drawbacks, it can't be used in the real world. So somehow you need the right trade-offs of powerful advantages and not too awful disadvantages. And somehow C had that. And it's not necessarily obvious. You can look at the description of a language and you might not pick which one is successful. But C was successful. It had proven itself to be successful. And from Briani's point of view, picking a language, a starting point, that had already proven itself to be successful was more important than trying to write something that would be somehow pure, not have that baggage, but also might have flaws in it that weren't obvious and would keep it from being successful. So given this trade-off between starting with something that works and has some baggage and is not mathematically pure in some sense, or trying to be pure, but take a chance on, on failing, that's not the way the C++ programmer wants to work. Because as I said, we want to be able to think about things at a high level. We want to be able to express our ideas uh, elegantly. But at the end of the day, we have to ship code. We are engineers. We don't have the luxury of saying, well, you know, it didn't actually work, but wasn't it beautiful? That doesn't, that doesn't work for us. I've never had a boss that would, that would buy that, right? It has to work. It has to ship. And so that's why 
Bjarne based it on something very practical. Unfortunately, this has led to this concept that there's something called C slash C++. There's no such thing. That's no more likely than, say, C slash Objective-C or Java slash JavaScript. They're related, but lots of languages are related. In fact, almost all languages, if you look at them, obviously have roots somewhere. But what happened was that when C++ got out of AT&T, when they made it available, it became very, very popular. In fact, during the 1980s, the rate of doubling of, u of users of C++ was about every seven and a half months. Every seven and a half months, the number of people using C++ doubled. This is phenomenal, particularly when you understand that AT&T wasn't promoting C++. They had allowed it to be released. But from AT&T's point of view, this is a useful language for us to use internally. AT&T wasn't selling a platform. AT&T did not want you hacking on the phone system. <laughs> that wasn't the point. So there are a number of languages, I'm sure you guys, if I said the name of a language, you could say, oh, that's the, you could name the company that has put a lot of money into marketing that language because they want that used on their platform. So languages like Swift or Objective-C or Go or Java, they have big companies that put money in promoting those. C++ never had that. And yet it still grew, as I said, during the 1980s, it doubled every seven and a half months. Phenomenal success there. So why? Why was the attraction? Why would people want to use C++? So for those of you keeping track, we're now at chapter one in the book. So the summary is high-level abstractions at low cost, which is something we've kind of been alluding to. And of course, low-level access when you do need it. We also see that it has this wide range of applicability, that it's highly portable. And then I'm going to take a little bit and talk about resource management. So let's start with high-level abstractions at low cost. Now, I'm not going to read all these abstractions. There's maybe others that I didn't even think to list on here. All of these are the kinds of things that uh, you don't need to write software. You can write software at the low level. But if you want to write large-scale software, you want to be able to capture ideas at the high level, these high-level abstractions, if they can be implemented efficiently, are a huge win for us. I'm going to talk about only one, and that is user-defined types. And the reason this is so important is because in C++, this is how we solve problems. You have a problem, you create a new type. That's what we do. So it's very, very important that when we create a new type, there's not a lot of overhead associated with that. The runtime overhead of creating a new type should, in fact, be nothing and is in C++. But these built-in types still have to be powerful and expressive because these are the building blocks that we're going to use in our software. So it turns out that with the techniques like operator overloading and other things that we can do, we can make user-defined types that are expressive and still very efficient. In fact, let's, let's just pick a couple of examples. You can create arithmetic types that are as efficient as the built-in types. In fact, we have an example of that. If you look in the standard library, there's complex numbers. Complex numbers are used in calculations by engineers, and they need to be very, very efficient but they're implemented in a library. And no one, as far as I know, has ever proposed that we take those complex numbers out of the library and build them into the compiler. Let's make them fundamental types so they'll be more efficient. Don't we want them to be efficient? Yes, we do. But we can't imagine that they would actually be more efficient than the way they're implemented in the library. C++ allows libraries that are expressive enough that we can use complex numbers efficiently and expressively with no performance overhead. Let's talk about object pointers, smart pointers. Smart pointers are a huge win for us over naked pointers because naked pointers cause leaks, memory, all sorts of problems. Smart pointers are so powerful. Notice, if you look at the code generated when you use a unique pointer and compare it to the code you would generate if you manually handled the news and deletes yourself, it's the same code. The abstraction penalty you pay to use a unique pointer is nothing at all. We made our own user-defined type to keep track of resources, this unique pointer we wrote, and it costs us nothing at runtime. That's the kind of performance that we expect in C++. Let's talk about function objects. Of course, 
the way we pass around functionality in most programming languages, you pass a pointer to a function somewhere. How much low overhead could you get? Well, in C++, we create function objects. And it turns out that if you're calling a generic, uh, uh, a generic algorithm or some other template code, it's actually more efficient to pass a function object than it is to pass a naked function pointer. Because the compiler understands the type of the function object. And because those operations can be inlined, it is actually more efficient to use a function object than to use a native naked pointer. And that's what we expect in C++. That's what we demand of this language. So um, I also want to talk about the fact that C++ is designed to support a number of programming paradigms. We're going to talk a lot about object-oriented, but the truth is there's a number of paradigms. They're all supported. None of them is forced on you. You don't have to use object-oriented programming because you're using what became known as the object-oriented programming language for a while. C++ was thought of as an object-oriented program. Yeah, it is, but it's not exclusively that. You can pick other programs, other paradigms, and they're not forced on you. In fact, you can mix and match whatever's necessary. If part of your application works best uh, using functional programming, go to town using functional programming. Combine functional programming and generic programming if that's the way to solve your problem. Whatever you want to do, the language doesn't force this on you. I think of C++ as a language for creating libraries. The kind of libraries that we can make in C++, I've already talked about uh, the uh, unique pointer library, where it's useful, it's powerful, it allows us to make certain that our code is safer to use and more reliable and costs us nothing at all at runtime, and it does this in an elegant way. And that's what we see about libraries. They are they allow us, the language supports libraries that are powerful, efficient, safe to use, uh, and can even have certain type-specific optimizations because of generic programming and specialization of that. And uh, it can be as efficient, generic programming can be as efficient as writing custom code. That's what we want from C++ libraries. I want to talk a little bit about the zero overhead principle, because the zero overhead principle has in fact been a driving idea in C++. But sometimes it's a little misunderstood about what exactly it means. There's two important concepts behind the zero overhead principle. The first is, if you don't use a feature, you don't pay for it. The reason this is so important is because we might want to use C++ in a very tightly constrained situation. We don't have much memory. We don't have a large time window. And if we, just because we use C++, now had a lot of runtime overhead, then that would mean we couldn't use it just to create a device driver or just to create a, uh, maybe a CGI on a, on a web server. So this ability requires that if we're not using features, there's no overhead pulled in for that. And the other concept is that if you do use a feature, the overhead cost is no greater than if you wrote it by hand. And I think this is one of the things that throws people off with this zero overhead, uh, the zero overhead principle. It doesn't mean there's no overhead. That's not what we mean. What we mean is there's no overhead, there's no overhead that's greater than, uh, than what you would create yourself. Uh, we have low-level access, and that is uh, essentially comes free because C++ was based on C. Based on C, a proven portable assembler, and uh, we get this at no additional cost to us except that we accept the runtime overhead associated with, uh, with uh, not the runtime overhead, but the uh, uh, baggage that we got from C being compatible with C. Once we've made this decision, we're going to be compatible with C, we get all this feature because that was built into C. Um, we also want to be able to uh, access in a number of varieties. We want the user to be in charge. So any object-oriented programming language has somehow has the ability to say, uh, 
access some memory from the heap and initialize it to use in this object. That's what object-oriented programming languages do. C++ does that as well. But for C++, that wouldn't be by itself good enough. We also want to be able to say, suppose that I have an object that I want to exist for the lifetime of the application. I don't want to have to call the allocator to allocate memory when I know I'm going to need it through the lifetime of the application. So we put it in static memory, and we can initialize objects in static memory just as easily as we can off the heap. Or suppose we wanted to put them on the stack. Now, the lifetime of stack-based memory is not flexible for us. Something on the heap, we can decide exactly when we want it. When we're finished with it, we can get it away. But something on the stack, we don't have much flexibility about when that lifetime exists. However, if we can live, live with that, with that uh, restriction, it is way, way more efficient for us to allocate objects on the heap, or excuse me, on the stack, than on the heap. And that's a huge advantage for C++ programmers that when we want to make an object, we aren't required to put it on a heap. That's at our option. But even that isn't powerful enough for C++. Because with C++, we really want to be able to take an arbitrary chunk of memory anywhere and put an object in it with an arbitrary lifetime. In fact, that's what the vector class, of course, does. Allocates a chunk of memory and then puts objects in it that have arbitrary lifetimes, that are controlled entirely by the library. That's the kind of power that we expect of C++. One of the things that we tend to agonize over are uh, cache optimization. We, we worry about things like false sharing. We worry about uh, putting things in contiguous buffers and things like that. This is the kind of thing that C++ programmers agonize over that people working in other languages often don't think about at all. It's not because their language solved that problem for them. Wouldn't that be nice? No. The reason they don't think about it is because there's nothing they can do about it anyway. The language doesn't give them that kind of flexibility. But in C++, if you want to have objects that are in a contiguous buffer, you can use certain library objects that are already set up, that certain containers already set up to use contiguous buffers. You could write your own, very efficient, just as efficient as any of the standard library uh, containers, and use contiguous buffers if you want to do that. All of this is available to us because C++ supports that for our libraries. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the applicability. C++ is used in a number of industries that seem to have very little in common with each other except for the fact that they use C++. They have wide, different requirements, and yet C++ manages those. In, in, in software engineering, when presented with an idea, we ask two questions. The first question is, does it work? But the second question is, does it scale? Because we're software engineers. A solution that works isn't good enough. It has to work, and it also has to scale. And in C++, we are actually concerned not just with scaling up, which is the usual thing, but we want to scale down. Because we might need to write code that works on a, on a device with very little memory. Or we might need to work in, a, in some other constrained environment. And so we want to know, can we write something with low overhead at runtime? But we also want to be able to go the other way. Can we uh, write a, a search engine that runs on thousands and thousands of machines, and can we do that in C++? Can we scale up? But there's another way of scaling up that's a completely different thing, and that is, can we scale up the team? Can we have 60, 70, hundreds of people working on a same application in C++? Does the language scale in that way? And of course, because C++ allows separate module compilation, it works that way to scale to very large numbers of users. And of course, as you might expect, because it's based on portable assembler, C++ is also very portable. C++ is based on the C machine model, which is what we see on uh, that hardware designers design uh, for. And so it makes it fairly easy to run C++ on another platform. Most platforms have one or more C++ tool chains. In fact, uh, if you look at the uh, popular mobile environments, they all support C++. And if you want to uh, write code that runs in one environment and make it run in another, you can write it portably. You can also exploit the uh, specific features of a particular platform if you want, but of course, that's the trade-off you make. Do you want to be portable? Do you want to, uh, do you want to access the particular features of an environment? 
Well, there's one other feature of C++ that I want to talk about, and that is the level of industry support. C++ is supported by millions of users. There are millions of people that know C++. There are hundreds of thousands of libraries that are available written to be used with C++. There are hundreds of books. There are scores of trainers. There are many, many conferences. Um, lots and lots of opportunities. Hundreds of videos on on YouTube that are available for you to learn about C++. That's a, that's a buy-in from the industry that is matched by very few other languages. And when we look at different languages and we say, well, we want high-level abstractions. There's lots of languages that give us high-level abstractions. But we want high-level abstractions, but also something that's, that's suitable for system programming. There's not as many languages, but there still are some. We can look at D or Rust or some other languages that are suitable for systems programming and also support high-level uh, abstractions. And then you say, but we want one that has significant industry buy-in, and it turns out all three of those things together, C++ is the only thing that has that combination of operating. So if I were to come to you and say, I've invented a new language. It's beautiful. The syntax is so pure that nobody's ever going to argue about East Const or West Const. It's just a wonderful language. And the semantics of it makes so much sense that it's easy to teach people. It's going to be a great language. And you're all excited about it. Wow, what a great language. Let's use this on our next project. Then I have to say, well, you know, we're not actually going to be able to hire anybody with experience in this language. Oh, that's OK. We'll, we'll just hire a bunch of good engineers, and we'll bring in some trainers. Oh, well, you're not actually going to be able to find anybody who can train in this language. That's OK. We'll get a bunch of books and videos, and they'll teach themselves. Well, you know, books, videos, that takes time to develop those, right? It turns out that, that the language itself is not good enough. You want a great language, of course you do. But you also want something that has an ecosystem that supports the language. And that's where, again, C++ is in a unique situation. So I, talked, I said we would talk about resource management. And there is one area of resource management that C++ um, is out of the mainstream of languages, let's say that. And that is that um, an awful lot of languages use garbage collection. And garbage collection solves an important problem. I don't know if you can tell in this lighting, but I have some gray hair. Every one of these gray hairs, that's a memory leak. Or a double dispose, or something else that I spent, I don't want to say how much time trying to track down. This is before I learned about unique pointer. But I think this is an important problem to solve. I've spent... A, more of my life than I want to think about solving the memory issue. And, and garbage collection is a way of doing that. And it's laudable for that. It has so caused lots of other people to not have to spend that time. But garbage collection is an engineering solution. And all engineering solutions mean trade-offs. And what are the trade-offs with garbage collection? Well, one of them is that we don't know when memory will be free. We don't even know if memory will be freed. And we may not have any control over when it's freed. So we may have a situation where uh, the garbage collector has decided now is the time to collect garbage. And your UI is frozen. And your UI user is wondering why their application is no longer in control. Uh, we may also have a situation, and I think this is the case with uh, applets on the Android, where the applet has to say, I need so much space, so much memory, and it's actually more memory than they're actually going to use, but they need to have that extra memory because the, the collector has a certain overhead of memory requirements in order to be uh, uh, useful. So these are, these are some of the downsides to garbage collection and some of the reasons why we don't think that's a good enough solution in C++. Instead, C++ is going to try a different track, and one of the drivers is that although memory is probably the resource that we care most about, at least that we use the most. But that's not the only resource we need to track. There's lots of resources that we need to track. We have file locks. We have uh, sockets. We have mutexes. There's lots and lots of things from the operating system that we need to make certain that we don't keep any longer than we actually need it. We want to free it as soon as we can. We want to manage it and then free it as soon as we can. And memory is only one of those things. And a garbage collector that doesn't collect garbage immediately means that it doesn't collect other resources immediately either. 
So in C++, we use a feature of the language called deterministic destruction. And we have an idiom called RAII. Some people think that means resource acquisition is initialization. I happen to think it means responsibility acquisition is initialization. But in either case, the code is the same. What it means is that when we acquire a, a, a responsibility, we create an object that corresponds to that responsibility, and we make sure that the lifetime of the object is the same as the lifetime that we want to track that resource. So when the object goes away, it releases the resource. And that way, we're releasing the resource as soon as we no longer need it, so that it can be used by other parts of our own application or perhaps by other things on the machine. And that's kind of the approach that we want to use to solve what otherwise might be solved with garbage collection. Now, other languages have a, a keyword that we don't need in C++, the finally keyword. But finally violates the DRY principle. What is DRY? So what's that? Can you say that again? One more time? Thank you very much. Um, I've gone as many as six. Anyway, um, yeah. So one way of solving the problem of releasing resources immediately is having the user say, every time you use my library, have a finally keyword and release the resource when you stop using the library. From the C++ point of view, that's inside out. We don't ask the users to track our resources for us. That's the library's job. Having to say, every time you use my library, you're going to have to tag on a finally is just a maintenance nightmare. Eventually, someone's going to forget the finally or uh, somehow under maintenance, going to cause us to have a problem that we don't want to have. In C++, as I said, we have libraries that can do magical things, including track their own resources, so that we don't need to have users be responsible for that. Have you ever noticed that Michael Case's name isn't mentioned enough in talks? All right. So now we're ready for the 90s. We've had a language that, because of the reasons we've talked about, has been very successful, doubling in number of users every seven and a half months. We head into the 1990s, and what's the important hot thing in the 1990s? Object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is going to solve all of our software engineering problems, right? Because we don't have to ever rewrite anything. We will write objects which are reusable. Does anybody hear the sarcasm in my voice? Right? I was programming in the 90s. I heard all this hype. And I bought into it. What did I know? I was young then. And, uh, but one thing I would say is, object-oriented programming does tend to work pretty well in GUI environments. If you want to implement a GUI, object-oriented programming can do that pretty well. And of course, we're talking about the 1990s. <laughs> it was the time of GUIs, right? Lots of graphical interfaces were being tried out, and a lot of things were happening. So it was a very interesting time for object-oriented programming, and this was the time when C++, because of its success in the 80s, had established itself, and it was known, as I said earlier, as the object-oriented programming language. So C++ was just exploding in the 90s. In fact, um, many companies that had significant investment in C++, a lot of code they'd written in C++, they went to Bjarne Strustrup and said, you know, this is a dangerous situation for us that we have a language that's controlled by one person and we have put millions of dollars of development effort into it. We need to standardize the language. We need to take it out of the hands of one person and make it a committee because we know how much better committees are at designing things. And Bjarni went along with this. He supported the committee. He's still active with the committee. He's still working on uh, forming C++. But, but this is an important milestone in the establishment of C++, Be when a language becomes an international standard, that's quite a vote of confidence from the industry, and it makes it possible for an ecosystem of tools and, uh, and training. There's, it's just much, much better for a language if there is a well-defined standard. And one day, ours will be well defined. Never mind. Uh, so I want to talk about Alex Stepanov, as you know, my idol. And while everybody else was crazy about object-oriented programming, Alex was doing something different. Alex was working on generic programming. He was, which is a term he coined, it was, he was working on a library that was allowing him to write generic algorithms. This is a very, very different approach 
to what most people were doing in the 90s. It was not an object-oriented approach. It was a different paradigm. It was trying to solve a different set of problems in a different way. But he was doing some interesting research. He worked at Bell Labs, and so did the man here on your right. This is Andrew Koenig. And he was the chairman of the library subcommittee of the Standards Committee. And he also worked at Bell Labs, so they knew each other. So he, he contacted Alex and said, Alex, are you going to submit your library to the Standards Committee to be part of the standard? And Alex said, oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Alex said, this is a much larger, my library is much larger than anything the committee's ever looked at for a library before. But there's also something else. And it might be a little hard for us today to understand this and to appreciate it because if, if you've only used C++ with generic algorithms as part of the library, you may not appreciate how radically different this approach was to what we were doing with object-oriented programming in the 90s. So I was programming in the 90s. I was a contractor. I would work on one project, and then I'd go work on another project, and I'd work on another project. And so there was no standard set of containers. You would use the containers that were part of the framework that you were working on. And the frameworks, the containers were always object-oriented. So when you put something in a container, essentially what that meant was you would copy the pointer to the object into the container. Because what would you put in containers? Well, you would put objects. And how do you refer to objects? With base class pointers, because you don't even know what the objects really are. You only know, well, it's derived from this. So that's what goes into the container. And that means now the container owns that object and is going to dispose of it or do whatever. Imagine how different it would be. And it's easy for me to imagine, because I remember the first time I used vector class. And I read about how you put something in the vector. And I said, wait a minute. I haven't put that in the vector. It's still right here. I put a copy of it in the vector. What a crazy idea. What kind of container doesn't, you can't put something in. You can only make copies of things. It was a crazy idea. Now, I'm a believer now. I think this is exactly how object-oriented, uh, excuse me, how containers should work. But it was radical to me at the time. And that's what Alex, when he showed his library to people, that's the response he always got. It took a while for people to understand it. So he said, I'm not going to submit it. And Andrew said, oh, well, I agree. The committee is not going to accept your library if you do not submit it. Alex recognized the challenge. And he and his team went without sleep for a few weeks as they made a formal proposal to the Standards Committee. And Alex actually went to the Standards Committee and gave a lecture explaining, explaining his approach, generic programming, generic algorithms, what he was trying to accomplish. And he was right. The committee's initial response was, this is this huge library. The, the mandate of the committee is to standardize existing practice. This is a research library. No one is using this in real world practice. It is not part of our mission. It is so different. And not only is the not in use, but the whole paradigm is a brand new paradigm. And so the initial response of the committee wasn't very promising. But I give a lot of credit to the committee because as they thought about it, as they discussed it amongst themselves, they began to realize that they could not imagine a standard that didn't include this library. Yes, it's a new way of using templates in, that hadn't been done before, but they recognized this is the correct way to use templates. This is how containers should be built. And so I give them a lot of credit. When they accepted it, and it became the C++ standard template library. So after Andrew Koenig was chair of the library committee, this man became chair of the library committee. This is Beeman Dawes. And Beeman Dawes was the chairman of the library subcommittee at the time the standard came out in 1998. And what Beeman recognized is that although they had added the standard library, the, the, the standard template library to the standard library, this was really a problem going forward for new versions of the standard. Because the mission, again, is to standardize existing use, existing practice. Were there any libraries in wide use? Yes, there were. But they were 
commercial proprietary libraries. They couldn't be standardized. There was no way to get a library in widespread use except to sell it. And that wasn't, that wasn't going to work for the standards committee. This was going to be a problem for the library subcommittee on an ongoing basis, and there had to be a way to address it. So Beeman worked with other people on the committee, including Dave Abrahams, and he created a website called Boost. And the mission for Boost was to do something that, again, today, we think nothing of it. You have a library you want to give away? That's what GitHub is for. Post it on GitHub. Let people know. Get on Twitter. Let them know, hey, here's my library. Right? In 1998, it didn't work that way. In 1998, this was a revolutionary idea. We're going to take software, we're going to make it freely available from a website. You just go to the website, download it, and you can just use it. That was an amazing thing. But on top of that, they said, we're not just going to collect a bunch of libraries that people give us. We're going to make absolutely certain that these are high-quality libraries. They meet a bar. So they were all peer-reviewed. Libraries don't go into the Boost library until they've been peer-reviewed. You have to have some minimal level of quality. And so the goal of Boost was to boost libraries in their usage and in their quality so they would be candidates for the standard. And in fact, since 1998, almost everything that has gone into the standard library has either come from Boost or been heavily influenced by Boost. The success of Boost for the mission it was set out for is undisputable. So what's our situation? Fast growth in the 1980s. To establish a library in the 90s that was standardized the ISO. Inclusion of a revolutionary template library that no other language at that time had. It's been copied since. Added to, this, to the library, on top of which now a free repository of high quality libraries available to you. It sounds like C++ is about ready to take over the entire world as we go into the 2000s. But something happened in the 2000s. So what is this Java thing? Well, it turns out that it supports object-oriented programming. And remember, that's the cool thing. It also, it's the language of the web. I don't really know what that means. Oh, that means it's the language of the future. Now that I understand. This is where you want to invest, right? Must be. And it's almost as fast. And, you know, it's a lot easier to learn and to teach. I can kind of imagine, imagine with me, the phone call that happens between some computer science professor and he's talking to the dean of computer science. And he says, you know our intro to computer science class that we teach in C++? Yeah. He says, you know, if we use Java, we could skip all of chapter 7. No pointers. So let's take a look at this. Let's start with the almost as fast. Wind your brain back to the 2000s. The 2000s was a time when uh, the hardware manufacturers were making processors that were so powerful and so fast that we didn't know why we would need to upgrade. The operating system vendors were adding gratuitous animation to the operating systems in order to justify selling you know, faster computers. It seemed like we had solved the performance problem. I mean, you can only recalculate your spreadsheets so fast. Instantaneous is just as fast as it can be. Half of instantaneous is still instantaneous. There's no reason to have anything more powerful. And if that's the case, then you become less interested in a language that promises better performance if there's any overhead associated with the development side. And with C++, that was the perception. It came with this you know, syntax baggage from the C world, on top of which, there's all this complexity. You had to understand things like templates and generic programming. There was this new, new library that's so different from everything else. And, and what about operator overloads? And did I mention pointers? Did I mention pointers? Right? So why would you want to write in C++ if you could write in an easier language and get results that maybe not quite as fast, but who needs speed anymore? We now have amazingly fast processors. And so we ended up with these managed language environments. One was the Java one, and one was the Microsoft one. 
And there are all sorts of different languages that were available. You could do all sorts of things. And the idea is these are easier to use than C++. They're maybe not quite as fast, but who cares? And pointers are hard. No pointers. How cool. So we mentioned that in 1998, right at the end of the 90s, the Standards Committee shipped the first international standard for C++. Now, you're all software engineers. What do you do when you ship a version of your software? Yeah, you, you take an afternoon off. Okay, fine. But then you get back to work. And the Standards Committee, I've talked to people who told me, yeah, 1998, we were exhausted. <laughs> but then they decided, okay, now what do we do? Well, what you do is you start working on version 2, right? And what is version 2 made up of? Well, version 2 is made up of all the features you wished you put in version 1. And maybe I should say version n plus 1 and version n. <laughs> but, uh, but you wanted all these features that you'd like to put in, but you have something else, and that is you have requests from users. You have feedback. You've given them a new, a new version. They start working with it, and they see things as users that you didn't see as developers. So they ask for features. And maybe the world has changed a little bit. Maybe features that you would never have thought about putting in your first version because it wouldn't make any sense then. But now, there's new hardware out there, new software, new things. And so they're asking for new features. So that's what version 2 is. It's a combination of the features you wish you'd put in in the first place, but all the new things that users have been asking for. But we have something interesting about a standard because a standard isn't used by users. A standard is used by tool vendors and is, is a one step away from useful. Standard by itself isn't useful until tools support it. And this, when in 1998, and I know when it came out, I was excited, I wanted to use it. Lots of people were excited. They wanted to use the new standard, but we all recognized this was not controversial. We were four or five years away from implementations that would support this. This is what the tool vendors themselves were saying. This standard is a lot different from what we're shipping, and it's going to take four or five years before we can deliver on this. Now, of course, in the meantime, they'll deliver a few features. But to get to the standard, nobody was denying that it was going to take close to half a decade. And so the Standards Committee was in an interesting situation because they didn't want to start standardizing new features until they got feedback on the existing standard. Does that make sense? And so they deliberately held off on standardizing things. And instead, what they did was they said, we'll address issues in the standard, fix bugs in the standard. And of course, bugs in the standard are not software bugs. They weren't talking about those kind of bugs. They were talking about descriptions that were incomplete or perhaps contradictory or certainly in, uh, unclear about what exactly they meant. And they spent years trying to improve the standard, deliberately not standardizing new features. And so what's the impact of that? Suppose you're an engineer on the standard. You have a day job. You go to standards meetings as volunteer work, essentially, on your part. The standards committee doesn't pay members to do this. And so the result was that the committee shrank. They had fewer people on it. And although the plan was to release a standard in the 2000s, there was a minor upgrade in the 2000s. There was a little bit. The committee was working, but they didn't make a major release during the entire 2000s. So it's kind of a bad time for C++. It runs after a great lot of momentum. It runs into the Java juggernaut, if you will. Loses lots of users. A lot of universities move away. No, no standard, no major standard comes out in the entire 2000s. There was a loss of momentum. A lot of people started to think that Java was a lot more interesting and was, in fact, the language of the future. There were people who were thinking that the future of C++ was to be the language of legacy programs. It was going to be the COBOL, the next COBOL. But that's not what happened. Starting in about 2010, 2011, the beast comes back. We're going to talk now about why the beast comes back some of the things that are happening, some of the reasons that the beast came back, but some of the results of the beast coming back. One of the things is that it turns out that we were wrong about the performance being solved because that's not a computer anymore. This is a computer. 
And this is a pretty fast computer. I don't really think about this, how slow it is. But I still want it to be efficient. Why? Because I do think about battery. Because worse than being a slow phone is being a dead phone. Right? That turns out to mean that I'm concerned about performance. The other thing is, the other magic about this machine is, you know, when I want to find something, I use maps. If this doesn't do the mapping, where's the mapping done? It's done in the cloud. It's the other part, right? There's no battery in here. At least I assume there's no battery in there. But I'm still concerned about efficiency. Why? Because I'm concerned about performance per dollar of hardware, performance per watt of power, performance per watt of cooling, it turns out that in the 2000s, when we thought we'd solved the performance problem because we just had processors that were so fast, we don't have to worry about performance anymore. That's a solved issue. It turns out, no. That's an anomaly. Forever, we will always want computers that are more and more performant. That's just that's what we want. And in fact, um, a guy named James Hamilton, who works at Amazon, did a study of large-scale, modern, high-scale data centers. And what he's talking about is, he's not talking about a data center that does a lot, of, a lot of different jobs like you might see at a university. He's talking about a data center where essentially we have thousands and thousands of computers that are essentially running the same software. Maybe it's a search engine. Maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's, it's, but it's some application that's being run identically across thousands of machines. And he did a cost analysis. And this is in, in descending order. The most expensive thing is the hardware, servers themselves. Probably not a big surprise. Um, the next most expensive thing is the power distribution, powering the hardware. Interesting, power distribution and cooling is more expensive than actual power paid to run the computer. That was surprising to me. Next is the networking equipment and then other infrastructure. Look around. That's what other infrastructure is. All right, the interesting thing here is that these top three are directly related to software performance. If you're writing software that's going into this data center and you can make the software 10% faster, you will save 9% of the costs on the bottom line. Almost 100% goes through. The cost of software performance is a significant driver of, of what we're doing here. And in fact, where are those performer, pr pr programmers, the IT, pr the personnel? In these high-speed data centers, the, the high-speed data center is expensive, the programmer is not that expensive. Their programmer time. So optimizing for the programmer time is optimizing for the wrong thing. Optimizing for the software run. Now, I'm not saying that's always true. I'm saying in a modern high-scale data center, which of course is a very important application, but not the only application in the world. So no major release came out in the 2000s, but that doesn't mean the committee wasn't working. The committee was very, very, very busy, but they didn't get a release out until 2011. And the new standard came out in 2011. Feels like a new language. And in fact, if you look at it, we almost double the size of the description of the language. Almost double, not quite. You know, one of the challenges that C++ faces, if you ask people, what's the biggest problem with C++? You never have anybody who says, well, if it was just a little more complicated and hard to use, a little harder to learn, then it would be about right. That's, I've never heard anybody say that. What is it? It's, oh, it's too complicated. And we say, what should the committee add to make C++ better? They say, it shouldn't add anything. <laughs> well, that's the problem. We could make C++ a lot less complicated if we could take things away. But what would we be doing? We'd be breaking code, right? Did I mention since the 1980s, major companies have been investing a lot of money in software? There's trillions of dollars worth of C++ out there. If we were to change the definition of the language in such a way that that code wouldn't compile anymore, we would be erasing value. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to add value. And so one of the challenges of the standards committee is, how do we add to the standard but simplify the language? It turns out you might say, well, that's impossible. You add something, you're going to make it more complicated. Well, you're certainly going to add the number of lines, 
because we can't take the old stuff away. But it turns out there's a number of features that the Standards Committee has been working on to make the language simpler, easier to learn, easier to use. That's not, of course, the only thing they did. They also did things to make it a more modern kind of language. This is what we expect in a modern language. Lambda expressions, Unicode, uh, maybe uh, tuples and smart pointers. These are the kinds of things we expect in a modern language. And then there's other kinds of things that, um, that we would expect just because it's a new version of C++. C++, as I said, it's all about supporting better libraries. And if you aren't a library uh, developer, you say, well, I don't need those features. Yes, you do because those library developers are working for you, and you want those features to make the library developer. If the library developer comes to you and says, I need this feature, then you don't even listen. You just say, yes, whatever you want, because you want better libraries. And then, of course, new areas. Move semantics, something that other languages aren't even thinking about. We've added that to C++. And, of course, multi-threading, because nobody ever did multi-threading in C++. Oh, never mind. Um, we want it in the standard. So it's in the standard now. But remember, um, I told you that, uh, that the Standards Committee, when it first released a standard in, in, uh, uh, in 1998, there was great agreement that there would be no implementation of that standard for four or five years. We live in a different world now. When C++11 came out, there were approximately two pretty much complete implementations of C++11 by, C++ by, by 2012. Within a year, two pretty complete implementations. One of them was this one. What is this? This is the LLVM and, of course, the Clang, the, the C language compiler built on that. But notice, Clang came out and created some competition. But Clang didn't come out of nowhere. Clang actually was going on all of the 2000s. But it wasn't of interest to C++ programmers because in the 2000s, it was really only a viable C language compiler. It didn't, it didn't support enough C++ features to be useful. But it was only at about 2010, 2011, 2012, about the time that you could actually compile C++ code with Clang, and because they knew the new standard was coming out, their target was never, well, we're going to implement classic C++, and then when we're finished, we'll add new features. They were trying to be a modern compiler from day one, so at about this time period, suddenly we had a compiler that could give a run for its money to other compilers. And particularly, it was really nice in terms of build performance, way faster to compile things with Clang than with other compilers, and the error messages. And I don't know if you can wind your mind back, but if you can pull up a, a compiler other than Clang from 2010 and compile code and look at the error messages and compare them not with Clang, but with the same compiler today, you'll see how much impact Clang has had on our industry. Because Clang set a standard saying, this is what error messages should look like. And the other compiler vendor said, yeah, you're right. That is what they should look like. And then there's been a lot of improvement there. But as wonderful as it is to have some competition, that's not the real impact of Clang and LLVM. The real impact is that this isn't designed to be a compiler. It's designed to be a toolkit. Compiler is only one thing you can do with the LLVM Clang technology. You can also create sanitizers. You can do feature testing. In other words, if I want to test out a new library, maybe I think it should go in Boost or the standard, I can give you my library, and you can run it on your environment and see how it works. But if I want to test out a new language feature, how do I do that? How do I implement it? I need to have an open source uh, implementation that is hackable. And of course, because Clang is written in C++, it makes it possible to add features to C++ for testing purposes. And I think this is really the long-term uh, impact that Clang has had and is having in our industry. There's an, another very important change. You know, in 1998, as I said, the Boost library were a source of open source software, but that was kind of a revolutionary idea. Now, nobody thinks about this at all. We just expect to be able to find open source libraries available to us. This is playing into the hands of C++, C++ because given 
rather than having something that we link against, we actually have source that is being compiled. And when we have source that's compiled, the compilers can do a lot more optimizations for us. So C++ is very much a, an open source friendly environment. Um, GitHub is not necessarily where we would expect to see a lot of C++ projects, but you'll notice that between 2010 and 2011, its comparative popularity on GitHub actually went up during this time frame. So I mentioned what happened to the language, the standards committee, when it shipped the standard in 1998. What happened to the committee? It got smaller. So what's going to happen when C++ 11 ships? Are we going to see the same thing again? Aren't the same factors at work here? Aren't people exhausted? It took 13 years to get this version of the standard out. Aren't they exhausted? What are we going to see happen? Is the committee going to shrink again? Yeah, maybe for a meeting or two, but what happened is it came back. And it came back so much, became so many people working on it, that they paralyzed their effort. They, they created something called study groups. There's even a couple that aren't on here yet. I think we're up to SG16 now with study groups. And the idea is that when people saw, you know, during the 2000s, there was kind of a feeling like C++ was like Latin. It was usable, but it was a dead language. But when the standard came out, people said, wait a minute, this is changing? And then when they see, hey, wait a minute, we can actually use these features. This was in the standard just last year, and now we're using this feature. It only takes a year to go from standard to users. That caused a lot of people who weren't interested in being on the standards committee to suddenly be interested in being on the standards committee. And breaking things out into study groups allowed people, allowed people who had a really narrow interest. If you were only interested in transactional memory and not really all of C++, you could serve on the committee. And so this ability to parallelize and have focused study groups has increased the rate at which we are Uh, increase the rate at which we are able to uh, develop software here. Excuse me just a second. Sorry about that. Um, something else happened about 2010, and that is, as I said, there was never an organization whose job it was to promote C++, but now there is. There's an organization called the Standard C++ Foundation. It is a nonprofit an industry consortium whose job it is to promote C++. Now, they don't have the deep pockets of a big company like AT&T or Apple or Google, but they have uh, established a website where we can talk about news, status, and discussions. And if you're an active C++ programmer, I should think you would want to visit this website at least once a week to see what's going on in the C++ world. There's an awful lot of interesting things there, including what they call the super fact. And the reason is because this is actually a merger of the C++ fact that has been online for literally decades, and Bjarne Struzrup's personal C++ fact have merged together. A number of other things have been added to this. So again, this is a, a valuable source of information for C++ programmers. A number of tools have come out for, to support C++ since 2010 as the beast roars back. The reason I'm showing you this particular one, not just because um, not just because they're here today, although we're happy to have them here today. Um, the reason I'm talking about this is because they did a lot of research into the, into the C++ market before deciding to go forward with this product project. Um, and um, Anastasia has published the research that they did, and so I've asked her if I could publish some of this information. Now, it's a little bit dated. This, this actually was back in 2015, and um, it's been updated for 2015, I should say. And these facts, uh, I asked Anastasia if I could share them, and she said, be sure to show people where they came from. What Anastasia wanted to, to make certain that we all understand is, this is really hard information to get. And so this may be the very best such information, but that doesn't mean it's good. There's a difference between best and good. <laughs> so this is hard information to get. This is estimates. We think it's something to think about, but it, it could be wrong. So the first thing that was kind of a surprise to me is the estimate that we were almost four and a half million programmers. Now this again, today it's probably closer to five million, so this is a few years out of date. But this was a surprise to me because the largest number I'd ever heard of before this study was about three million. 
But what kind of really I found interesting was not just its comparative, because I kind of had a feel for C++ being in the top few languages, but the distribution. Because I'm from North America, and of course I naively believe the entire world is in North America. But it turns out that there are three times as many C++ programmers in Europe and Asia than there are in North America. In fact, there's almost half as many just in South America. That's, that means I need to go to more European conferences, obviously. right? One of the other things that um, at the time I thought was kind of interesting is where C++ is relatively ahead of other languages. I've since kind of had this validated because uh, one, of the, one of the things that I do is I work on conferences, I work on C++ Now, and one of the things that we do at C++ Now is we, uh, we have volunteers that we financially support to attend the conference in exchange for them helping to run the conference. And so we get resumes. And one of the things I would say is sometimes I think about the fact that I'm asking volunteers to do things like hand out badges and hold up signs. <laughs> uh, and they're PhD candidates in robotics or something like that. I think, you know, they're a little overqualified for what I asked them to do. But of course, the real reason they're there is to be part of C++ Now and be part of that community, which we love. But the interesting thing is that I was talking to the individual who collects these resumes from across the world, and he said, you know, we're consistently getting really high resumes from Eastern Europe, or high quality resumes. If you get a high quality resume, from some place, you say, well, that's an outlier. That's a particularly bright person who came from there. But if you're consistently getting quality, then that means something about the environment. That means something about uh, the, the social situation there. It means something about the educational system there, the values there. And so this is really something that I think is, uh, is something to be proud of here. Um, this is a distribution of where we see C++ programmers working. Probably not a big surprise. I actually think that the finance industry doesn't actually employ that many more C++ programmers. I think they just run more ads for C++ programmers because the data here is based on job listings. So another important thing that has happened in the last five years, since 2010, say, um, is a, a, a podcast for C++. There has been a single audio podcast available. And they're on, I think, episode 145 or something close to that. They've been in business for over three years now. This is a, how many of you have heard at least one episode? That's pretty good. Should be more of you. No commutes. Commute time is great for listening to podcasts, right? Because they don't read code to you. It's an interview show. Don't worry about that. They're not trying to read code to you. Uh, but you can listen to great interviews, and it's a great podcast. There's also another one that's been a video podcast, and it's turning into both video and audio. And for those of you who are interested, come by and see me. I have stickers. Uh, this, is, uh, this is my video cast, and it's now going to be an audio cast. And that's probably inevitable, because all my life, people have been coming up to me and saying, John, you're so good looking. You really should be on the radio. So, um, of course, there are online forums where you can see information about C++. Stack Overflow gets hundreds of questions on a daily basis for C++ and uh, a lot of good answers there. There's a uh, cprogramming.com, which is a resource for C and C++. Uh, if you're not using cppreference.com as your online reference, start doing that now. This is an incredibly valuable resource. This is actually a wiki. So it's community supported. And notice, this says C++20 here. That is not a typo, and it is not boasting. This wiki stays up to date. It is accurate, and it is timely. And it already has things that uh, are from the C++20 standard, even though that standard hasn't been issued yet and obviously isn't going to be for another couple of years. And you say, well, wait a minute. That's going to confuse me when I look at this. No. When you look at CPP reference, everything is carefully tagged if something became deprecated, what version was it deprecated? If something was introduced, what, in, what version was it introduced? No possibility for you to become confused. Everything is properly tagged. It is a wonderful, wonderful reference. Absolutely. If you're looking something up online, this is where you want to look it up. 
and then Reddit. So you may not be able to see all these figures here, but essentially Reddit, the subreddit, the CPP subreddit, was created in, in 2008. And then it got its first 10,000 subscribers in 2012. It took that long, four years, to get 10,000 subscribers. And then it got into the top 1,000 about the same time, top 1,000 subreddits. But if you could see these dates and these numbers, you would see that we're adding about 10,000 subscribers a year. And now we're at 60, I think it's something like 62,000 or something like that subscribers on Reddit right now. There's a new, uh, a new C++ community, and it's called Slack. How many of you have joined this? Okay, that's not nearly enough of you. Um, it's a little bit tricky because I could give you the URL, but you actually have to be invited to get on the Slack. So what you do is you go to this URL, and you type in your email address, and it will invite you. <laughs> so this is the auto-invite. Slack doesn't support a public team. They call it a workspace. They don't support a public workspace. So we want it to be public. And so the workaround is go to this URL, just type in your email address. You'll get an invitation. And then once you're in Slack, there's all these different channels, including, yes, there is a CPP Russia channel. You can talk to people on any number of topics about events, ask questions. There's all sorts of stuff going on. This is very, very active subreddit. And the, the kinds of people who are on there and can give you authoritative answers to any kind of question you have, is, it's just astounding. This is an incredible opportunity. Make certain that you're taking advantage of this. Very, very valuable. All right, going back to the, um, the Standards Foundation, and I want to repeat again that URL is just isocpp.org. Uh, not only do you see... Uh, news articles, but you also see the FAQ, and one of the pages of the FAQ lists all the user group worldwide, and there's even a map. The map only gets updated about a couple times a year because it's a pain to update, but, uh, and you, uh, you'll see, if, if you drill in, you'll see the individual locations. It, it bunches these together, so you can see there's about 25, almost 25 groups in the United States, and over 50 groups in Europe. Most of these groups, not all of them, but most of them, have been formed since 2010. It's part of the beast is back phenomenon. We also have, this is brand new, so it's not as filled in as it should be, but this is the uh, C++ calendar so that you see things not geographically, but instead chronologically. So you can see upcoming events. We have conferences on here. We have C++ standards meetings, and we even have individual user groups. At least that's, uh, that's what we're building to. So check that out. Uh, particularly if you want to know what's coming up, that you know what videos to look for and things like that. So I did mention conferences. I'm very active with conferences and very happy to be here at this conference. Um, these conferences have pretty much started since, again, 2010 now. C++ Now actually was in existence already as BoostCon, but it reinvented itself as C++ Now. Um, the, uh, but all of these are active conferences but it turns out, uh, if you're interested, by the way, in attending CPPCon, you need to go to this URL right now because uh, getting visas is, a, is an issue. So if you're coming from here and you want to go to the conference, love to have you there. Go to that URL, get an invite, and you'll get uh, an invitation sent to you. Fill out a form there, and, and we'll have an invitation sent to you. So um, this is the Audio Developer Conference, not actually a C++ conference, but most audio developers are using C++. Of course, C++ Russia, Core Hard, I see they're represented here. Um, and then Italy, Spain, there's a number of them. I can't keep track of them at all. In fact, since I can't keep track of them all, I created a web page to keep track of all the conferences. So again, if you know of a conference that's not on there, please, uh, this is a wiki, so add this or contact me, I'm happy to add it and keep it up to date. So one thing I want to talk about is uh, a project by uh, Robin Kuzman. Robin is here today. I'm not sure where he is, but he's joined us at the conference. There's Robin. Thank you, Robin. So Robin was one of the volunteers at C++ Now. And he came to me and he said, John, would you mind if I took the videos for C++ Now and captured them in Russian and put them on my site? So Robin's an American, but he's from Russia. He's fluent in Russian. And he says, would you mind if I did that? 
Well, I wouldn't mind, but I also know, because I see these videos being copied everywhere, that I couldn't stop him if I did mind, but I wouldn't mind. But well, actually, what I said is, wouldn't it be better if instead of making a copy, even if they're Russian captioned, why don't you take the originals and add Russian captions to the originals? And so we went back and forth about this and how to do this, and we've actually started a project, and it's called the C++ Video Access Project. It has two goals. We want to take C++ videos and first make English, English language captions. So English language captions do two things for us. One is there are people who don't hear, and they're going to be able to see and enjoy the videos, and there are people who their reading skills in English are better than their listening skills in English, and so that serves them. However, then the second goal, the second step is, once we have the captions in English, is to translate those. And I want to have people from all over the world translating these videos. So I'm making a plea to you, please. Um, I will say that the first step is very hard. Captioning turns out to be harder than translating, at least that's what I'm told. I'm not bilingual, so I'm not going to do any of the translating. But captioning is hard. However, for CPPCon last year, we paid to have all of our videos, that's over 100 hours of C++ content, professionally captioned. Not by a computer, by humans. All of that, all of the videos from CPPCon last year are captioned in English. And they're just waiting for someone who would do the translation for us. So that's my plea to you. Go to this URL. Read about how you can help. I guarantee if you pick a video and watch it, you'll learn something about C++. But if you translate it, you will learn it much better. You will understand it at a better level. So picking a video, even if you just do part of it, you will increase your C++ skills, and you'll be doing something for other people who speak Russian. So that's my plea to you to join us in this effort. And at this point, I'm going to ask if there's any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>